This is part 5 of lecture 7 of ELEC 5300. We'll be talking about the kramer rao bound. So the kramer rao bound is a lower bound on the performance of an estimator. So let's talk about um, different performance measures of an estimator. So an estimator is said to be minimum variance if the variance of the estimator is less than that of any other estimator. And of course, uh, that's what we'd like, um, especially if the uh, estimator is unbiased. Uh, because in the case of the unbiased estimator, then the variance is the same as the mean squared error. Uh, you know, of course, we wouldn't want to have a minimum variance estimator which, you know, gave us a completely erroneous estimate. So the kramer rao bound, then, is a lower bound on the variance of any unbiased estimator. So if you can calculate the variance of an estimator, you wouldn't, might want to know, well, is that the minimum variance estimator? Uh, in order for you to know that, you'd have to know, well, what is the minimum variance? And so if the variance of the estimator is the same as the minimum variance, uh, then you know you've, you've hit it. And so the kramer rao bound is a lower bound on the variance. And so if you achieve the kramer rao bound, then you know uh, you must be uh, the minimum variance estimator. And so any other estimator that actually achieves that kramer rao bound is said to be efficient. And so the kramer rao bound uh, here uh, is, has this form here, and we'll also look at another form of the kramer rao bound that instead of looking at uh, this kind of a derivative of the log likelihood squared, we'll look at the second derivative. But let's prove that one form right now. And in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with something that we know is true, and then we're going to manipulate that. So we know the following is true. Uh, since the estimator is unbiased, I know the expected value of the estimator right, must be equal to the actual value of the thing that we're trying to estimate, uh, little theta. And so I'm going to here use the notation theta hat uh, to mean the estimator. And so if this is true, if these two things, the expected value of this is equal to that, then the expected value of this minus that must equal to zero. And then I just substitute the definition of the expected value inside here. So I just take this and I integrate it over all possible values of x. So this is an expected value with respect to x. Remember, theta is just some fixed parameter that we're trying to estimate. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to differentiate this thing uh, with respect to theta. So Assuming we can swap the order of differentiation and integration, I can take this derivative and put it inside here. Right? And then what I get is uh, the d derivative of a product. Right? So you know that if I have something like, let's say, d, uh, dx of ax bx, right? then that's just d dx of ax times bx plus ax times d dx bx, right? So in order to take this, I just have to differentiate this and multiply it by that, and then take this and multiply it by the derivative of that. And so when I differentiate this with respect to theta, I just get a minus 1. So I get a minus f of x theta. So here I get the minus f of x theta. And then when I to multiply this, which is down here, uh, times the derivative of this, I just get the derivative of f of x theta with respect to theta. Now when I differentiate this, uh, sorry, when I integrate this term here, this is just the integral of f of x dx. Right? So I know that this thing is equal to 1. And so when I have a minus sign here, I can take this over to the other side, and I'm just left with this, which I replicate down here, is equal to 1. So I'm going to repeat this equation here on the next page. So this is where I repeat it. This is from the last page. Now I'm going to do a little trick. I'm going to say, well, if I take the derivative of the log of f of x theta with respect to theta, right? Whenever I take the derivative of the log, I get 1 over, right? So I get 1 over whatever is inside here, so 1 over f x given theta. And then by chain rule, I have to differentiate this with respect to theta, so I get that. So that's chain rule. 
And then I'm just going to say, well, if I want to, this thing here is the same as that. And so I'm going to replace this thing here with um, this times fx given theta. Right? So I just take this and I replace it with this. Now I'm going to take this and, multi and divide it into two terms. I'm going to divide it into uh, one term that contains this and square root of this, and I'm going to take, it, uh, take another term and that includes this and the other square root of this. Right, so all I've done here is split the f of x given theta into two square roots, and I've split this into two terms here, uh, integral of f of x, uh, sorry, g of x times h of x dx. And this is kind of a generalization of the dot product. And so there's the Schwartz inequality uh, that looks at uh, the dot product. And so just to remember to, to recall what the Schwartz inequality is uh, in a regular, let's say, 2D vector space. So if I have uh, two vectors, let's say, uh, a vector in, in the 2D space x, and another vector y, right? then you know that if I take x dot y, right, that's equal to the absolute value of x, or the, the length of x, times the length of y, times cosine of theta. And so theta is the angle here. And you know that theta is between uh, minus 1 and 1. Actually, achieves those values. So if I square everything, what I get is the squared value of x dot y is less than or equal to the squared value of x plus the squared value of y. And so the Schwartz inequality is just this, except you can apply this to any vector space, and so a function uh, is in a vector space where the dot product is just in, um, is just indicated by the integral over uh, the function. Uh, uh, sorry, the dot product between two functions, let's say g of x uh, and h of x, is just the integral of g of x, h of x dx, right? So this is the inner product. Just like if I have two vectors, let's say um, xi and yi, right? Then the inner product, let's say this is vector x, is equal to some set of x1 through xn and y, vector y is y1 through yn, and same thing for xi, then the dot product of x dot y is just summation over i xi yi. Right. So the only thing I've done here with functions um, is I've replaced the index, the, the integer index here, by a real variable x, and instead of doing the sum over i, I just integrate over x. So that's the Schwartz inequality, which is basically just a generalization of the normal idea of the uh, dot product in uh, 2D or just regular finite dimensional uh, vector space, Euclidean vector spaces. So I can call this g of x, and this is a h of x, and then I can say, well, this thing here is going to be less than or equal to this product here. So that means that if this is equal to 1, then 1 must be less than or equal to this product here. And equality here um, <coughs> occurs if and only if there's a k such that g of x is equal to k uh, times h of x. Now to look at that, what that means if we go back to the uh, 2D Euclidean space, that we talked about before, right? When is this equality satisfied? This equality is satisfied if cosine 
of theta is equal to 1 or minus 1. And so when cosine of theta is equal to 1, it just means that the angle between the two vectors is either 0 or when it's minus 1, it's 180 degrees. So this is achieved if x and y are, are collinear, right? So if this is x, then y is in exactly the same direction. Uh, or I might have the opposite case here where, let's say, if x is in this direction, then y might be in this direction. But in either case, I can just say, well, x is equal or let's say y is equal to k times x, or x is equal to k times y, where in this case here k is positive, and in this case here k is, ne uh, this case here, k is negative. So if we take this and we apply Schwartz inequality to that, we'll do that on the next page, then this is uh, g of x squared. And this here is h of x squared. So this is the Schwartz inequality. And I know that uh, equality is achieved if and only if the square root of this is collinear with the square root of this. Uh, here they share this term here, the f of x uh, given theta. So I don't have to worry about that. That's common to both terms. So I just have to say, well, this thing here, or the square root of this, is equal to k times the square root of that. And I have the k theta here just to indicate the k here uh, can change with theta, right? So this has to be true for all x's, right? And it has to be true for all thetas, right? But then the k can change with theta. So this is going to become important later on, but for now, let's just focus on this thing here. I can take, uh, let's say, this part here and divide through by that. So I get that this thing here, which is that, is greater than or equal to 1 over this. right? So this thing here uh, raised to the minus 1 power. If I look at this thing a little bit more, this thing here is just the variance. Remember, this is a minimum, sorry, this is an unbiased estimator, so this is theta is just the expected value of this. So this is the variance of this thing here. And the integral inside here right, is just the expected value of this, right? Because I'm just integrating over f of x uh, dx. Right? So that's the expected value of that uh, raised to the minus 1 power. And so that's the uh, proof of the kramer rao bound. Now we're going to take this and look at this thing a little bit more uh, to prove that actually the minimum uh, likelihood estimate is, if it's uh, unbiased and an efficient estimator exists, then it is the maximum likelihood estimator. Okay, so that's what it says here. And the proof here is the following, I'm going to take 1, which said this from the previous page. And I'm going to notice that this has to be true for all values of theta right, and all x's. right. So no matter what x I have and a theta I have, this is true. So I'm going to evaluate this at a particular value of theta. right. In particular, I'm going to evaluate it at the value of theta which is the maximum likelihood estimator. So if I evaluate this at the value of theta where it's the maximum likelihood estimator, then I know that because uh, the maximum likelihood estimator must maximize the log likelihood, the derivative here of the log likelihood must be equal to 0. So I get 0 is equal to this. Right? I evaluate this part here also at the uh, maximum likelihood estimator. This is just some kind of constant. I don't have to worry about this thing here. Uh, so that implies that this thing is equal to 0. And therefore, that the estimator here is equal to the maximum likelihood estimator. And so 
if there is an efficient estimator, uh, it satisfies this, and therefore uh, it must be the maximum likelihood estimator. However, uh, in many cases, the maximum likelihood estimator is not efficient. For example, it may be uh, biased. Uh, in this case, uh, then there is no efficient estimator. However, it can be proven uh, that the maximum likelihood estimator is asymptotically uh, efficient. In other words, as I get more and more uh, data, then the maximum likelihood estimator becomes closer and closer uh, to being efficient. Okay, so moving on, uh, we're going to look at the next lecture. Uh, some further extensions of the kramer rao bound, in particular, we'll be looking at uh, the alternative form as well as an example.